right, uh, let's get started. So I'm John Kenny. I'm a professor in computer science at Berkeley and um, also currently half time at uh, Yahoo Labs. And um, the talk is about uh, reaching the limits for machine learning dictated by hardware. And there's uh, two parts of the talk. There's performance uh, on single machines, <clears throat> limited by memory, ALU, and so on. And then we're going to look at scaling up um, onto clusters and what are the limits that appear there and how close can we get to those limits. So a uh, quick bit of history. Um, I'm uh, an academic, although I seem to have spent a lot of time in industry and roughly half the time in the last decade has been in different companies on various leaves. And early on I was at, uh, um, at Yahoo actually and um, worked with a team on an early implementation, Hadoop implementation of uh, a learning algorithm that was being pushed into production. And uh, my role was typically doing, uh, in a lot of these companies, was doing some prototyping of learning algorithms, trying to improve Lyft and so on. And um, not necessarily the production part, although interestingly with the, the Yahoo um, deployment was interesting because um, I had a prototype that was fairly well optimized using some you know, fast uh, Intel uh, primitives for matrix operations. Um, and the Hadoop implementation went on for a few months and eventually the team was happy with the implementation and we wrote a paper. But um, reading the paper I noticed that the performance actually wasn't faster than the C implementation. And that was an interesting um, development but turned out to sort of be a, a, a presagement of uh, a lot of the other work that we ended up doing. Because if you really optimize on single machines um, you have actually an intrinsic advantage. So. Um, and the, the view I've adopted over the years of data modeling, um, at least in industry, looks something like this. Um, there's a sandbox of data that's taken somehow um, from live data. Um, and an analyst has to sort of hypothesize structure in the, in the data, um, test and validate those hypotheses by building models, running them, looking at the results, and ideally iterating as rapidly as possible. Um, each time you iterate, you likely get some improvement in performance. So the faster you can go around that cycle, generally speaking, the better models you get and potentially the more re revenue you can generate. Um, but this is a point of pain with a lot of systems. A lot of systems are not really set up to do this very well. And the other point of pain I noticed was often the translation from um, prototypes into production models. It's often done in a different uh, software base by a different team. And there's usually a lot of loss of performance across that boundary that people don't notice because there's no closing of the loop. So anyway, so my group for a while has been developing uh, machine learning toolkits. Uh, why are we doing this? We're obviously gluttons for punishment, but there's the three reasons that I've sort of alluded to. We feel like um, performance of toolkits right now is well below where it could be. Um, especially uh, given recent developments in SIMD hardware, GPUs primarily. Um, and I'll talk a little bit in a moment about bisection bandwidth, which turns out to be the critical resource for a lot of machine learning, more so than the um, raw arithmetic performance of the system. And current GPUs have a bisection bandwidth that roughly 10, 1,000, comparable with the current commodity clusters of 1,000 to 10,000 nodes. So that's a pretty big advantage if that's the, um, the, the determining feature of performance. Um, so some things I won't really go into today include also interactive modeling. Um, the idea here is that machine learning is actually a really uh, a way of articulating some pretty complex business goals for a company that include obviously making revenue but also keeping uh, other stakeholders happy. So um, almost all the systems I've worked on actually when they're put in production have secondary performance constraints to keep advertisers or users happy. Um, those typically aren't incorporated into the modeling process which means the modeling process is suboptimal. So we're trying to find ways of uh, bringing in more of those uh, secondary business logic constraints early into the process. So the models are really being fully optimized for the runtime environment. And the last thing is that we're trying to develop the toolkit that can actually run in production with giving more or less the same uh, experience to the user as during prototyping. All right, so back to scaling in, uh, inward. The approach we have is based on roofline design, which is a, a method originally described by other people at Berkeley, uh, Dave Patterson and some uh, colleagues. And it's basically 
you know, writing down, articulating, and graphically representing uh, the limits on a particular architecture, and most relevant to things like scientific computing, but it's also very relevant to machine learning. So a CPU, for instance, has a basic arithmetic logic throughput, which is how fast the uh, floating point units can run when they're uh, fully fed with data. A GPU is quite a bit higher. It has most of its area devoted to doing arithmetic, so it has a much higher capacity. Um, but very often you don't have enough data to feed to keep the uh, processing units busy. So um, you develop these uh, diagonal roof lines which represent the trade-off between um, the memory bandwidth and, uh, if you like, how many the density of the operations. Operational intensity means roughly how many times you reuse a piece of data that's being pulled in from memory. The more times you can re reuse it, obviously, the closer you can get to the ALU throughput. And so that gives you a, a sort of linear relationship with the ultimate throughput, the ultimate rate of doing computation per unit time. Um, and uh, so, as I just mentioned, the, there's a big difference in the amount of area in um, CPUs versus GPUs devoted to arithmetic. You can see it there. Um, the other big difference, though, that's actually more relevant for a, a lot of machine learning is the memory architecture. And um, on CPUs, there's a fairly classical um, pyramid-shaped hierarchy of memories that get progressively smaller and progressively faster. Um, the GPU is interestingly, though, rather different. First of all, it starts off with a pretty big advantage in main memory bandwidth. Um, GPUs have been optimized for very rapidly swapping in texture maps and triangles and so on. And that's actually very useful uh, for machine learning. That's actually the main, that is really the, uh, the ultimate determinant uh, performance from the majority of machine learning algorithms. Um, and otherwise, you, you see the rest of the memory hierarchy is kind of different, though. It's almost upside down. And in fact, the largest um, internal resource of memory within the GPU chip is actually register memory, single cycle access uh, registers. That's radically different from a CPU. It's about three orders of magnitude more memory devoted to um, single cycle storage. And uh, if you can write your algorithm to uh, exploit that extra storage, it can be very fast. It essentially has no limit because it's running you know, every cycle. So, but it does require often some um, fairly aggressive re rethinking and redesign of algorithms to exploit that. Anyway, it's an interesting design space. And you can see the contrast there sort of geometrically between the two architectures. One, the pyramid, one's more of an hourglass. So um, yeah, and all right, so if we go back to the, the roof line plot, um, the classical uh, difference between ALU and uh, performance on CPUs and GPUs is shown by these uh, diamonds and the GPUs generally give you about 10x the performance for, um, for dense operations. So that's very relevant for deep learning. Convolutional kernels and uh, dense matrix multipliers sit over here and so that's why GPUs are so popular for deep learning. But they're very much underappreciated for uh, sparse machine learning. Um, but they still have almost a, a 10x advantage there as well, and that's because of the difference in main memory speed. So, um, yeah, so that's an observation we, we made a, a little while ago, and we've been sort of uh, riding that, uh, that uh, observation for a few years now, and it's consistently giving us good results. Um, the other thing to say is that, you know, these are just theoretical limits. They're not that interesting until, unless you can get close to them, but the important practical feature of this kind of design is that people have been able to get essentially all the way to the roof lines or very close, both for dense operations and also for sparse operations. Interestingly enough, um, NVIDIA didn't get this close. This is the performance of our kernels. Their kernels were optimized really to different types of workload, scientific workload, and they don't actually work that well on um, typical machine learning, learning workloads. We simply rewrote them. It, it actually wasn't difficult. But um, the point is, uh, you have to get them probably from us because they're not otherwise available. Um, all right, so, and I'll just draw this, quickly draw the contrast between the GPU's main memory bandwidth and a, a, a data center topology. And um, this is the one that Google recently published in their Jupyter paper as saying, all right, we don't do this anymore. Um, it's actually, uh, Google is, it's probably fairly far ahead of most companies in that the things that they threw away and are not doing anymore are fairly close to what some companies are just starting to do right now. 
But um, th anyway, this is a, um, you know, a set of racks and then a, a, an interconnect, really just a one layer interconnect. So many other systems will have a couple of layers above the racks. Um, but the key feature of this is that it's significantly oversubscribed. Actually not terribly oversubscribed. A lot of other centers, first generation data centers are much more heavily oversubscribed and they're oversubscribed in multiple layers. This one's a 10x oversubscription. That means the, uh, the bandwidth <clears throat> above the, the rack switch is only a tenth of the potential uh, data throughput coming from the rack. So the rack, you know, as data goes up through the rack, it gets uh, throttled back down to a tenth as it goes into the, the larger fabric. Um, so your actual um, aggregate bandwidth of this particular network, then it's, again, it's first generation. It's just one gigabit network to the host. Um, of, of the full 20,000 nodes, it's only about 220 gigabytes a second. So it's smaller than what a GPU has, current GPU. Um, so the potential performance of fairly big clusters is still pretty limited. Um, and of course, people are now using um, 10, generally building 10 gigabit infrastructure in the, uh, the nodes. But on the other hand, very few people are um, actually uh, providing full throughput through the rack switches. Google is with Jupyter, but I don't, the Facebook recently announced their next generation network and it's four to one oversubscribed there and most other companies I believe are still uh, creating bottlenecks here. So no one, very few companies are going to have full bandwidth anyway through the network. Um, this number will certainly go up and so it'll be worth, uh, you know, several GPUs but maybe still less than 10. So you can see the, the competitive advantage of the graphics process pretty high. All right, so um, yeah, so yes, yeah, so, well here's Facebook again. So anyway, oversubscription still seems to be the norm because as, they, as people move to a 10 gigabit hosts, it becomes much harder to provide that full bandwidth through the rack switch. Um, yeah, all right. So that suggests graphics processes have a lot of potential. Um, and it's not just potential because you actually can realize the, uh, get close to the roof line limits for throughput. Um, and also they have that 10x gain that I just talked about. Um, yeah, and so when uh, one uh, challenge that we face when we try to uh, build up using clusters, we still want to do clusters of uh, GPU machines because we can then potentially multiply the performance, but more importantly, we can multiply the size of models. Um, we have a harder challenge because when the um, performance, the throughput of the nodes goes up, if the fabric speed stays the same, you really don't have an advantage from making individual nodes faster. So somehow you have to find ways of making the communication faster as well or uh, reducing the amount of communication. So we spend a lot of time doing that too. So here's a quick uh, block diagram of our tool. <clears throat> which is called uh, Bidmark, so we can, <laughs> when the releases come out, they're Mark 1, Mark 2, etc. Um, so we're still in the Mark 1 phase. Um, and it's a, a set of classes, it's in the Scala language, the same as um, Spark. And it's a set of classes that basically uh, do streaming uh, inference on data sets. So although the data sets may actually be finite fixed data sets, they're um, fed through the learning class as a stream off of disk or off uh, out of an HDFS. Um, and the, uh, the learner dispatches them to, uh, currently we just support GPUs on the same machine. So typically that's up to four GPUs. Um, the batches of data are farmed out and then the processes on each GPU are themselves modular. And that way we, we have a basic model um, loss function plus loss functions for those secondary criteria that I talked about. So you can kind of mix, mix and match the performance criteria uh, when you create a learner. Um, so it's pretty flexible and, and, um, and high performance as well. Um, it's in um, Scala, which some people will know from Spark. Um, so it's nice, it's an interpreted language. It's actually just in time compiling as you type. Uh, so it's scriptable. It has this open syntax, which we, we like a lot. Um, there are math characters in Unicode that you can actually type if you remember the um, escape codes. And so you can actually make um, machine learning code that looks really like the kind of uh, descriptions you might publish in a, a math journal. Um, we, you know, interface actually naturally with the uh, 
Hadoop Yarn ecosystem and Spark. But uh, a, a differentiating feature of this uh, toolkit is that it's fully hardware um, accelerated and that code has to be in C. So we really do get the full performance of CPUs and GPUs. And Java systems probably between 1 and 10 percent, probably closer to 1 percent uh, of the sh machine performance is available in those systems. Um, and um, yeah, a nice, nice abstractions for parallel computing, um, actors and parallel collections in Scala. And we, we do an ad hoc kind of memory management that works for this class of learners because the, uh, for, for a lot of reasons, memory management garbage collection would be extremely expensive on GPUs and probably impractical. So we do something different. Okay, so um, <clears throat> I'll quickly go through some benchmarks. Um, our benchmarks are continually evolving if you have any favorite benchmarks that you think are important. We're trying to sort of have a representative set of, of benchmarks uh, across different machine learning domains. Um, and so we do classification, click prediction, um, clustering, that's an image data set, um, you know, collaborative filtering, topic modeling, and so on. And just quickly, we, we tried to compare against the, the fastest um, single machine systems that we know about and similarly for cl cluster systems. Um, Graph Lab, it's the academic version because as far as I know, the commercial version doesn't yet support parallelism, but that might have changed. Um, uh, anyway, so the single machine be benchmarks, um, <clears throat> this is a Reuters data set. Um, uh, it's uh, 103 different classes, so we label the different classes. We train and label the classes in parallel. Um, and that's a, a single current GPU and takes about five seconds on that data set, that half gigabyte data set to train the models and the cost is about a tenth of a penny. Um, so we're about an order of, well, let's see, a couple of orders of magnitude faster than VW, which is a, a, a fairly well accelerated toolkit originally from Yahoo um, that's used in a number of uh, larger companies as well a sort of state-of-the-art single machine learner. And we get two orders of magnitude. One of them is um, from using GPUs. This is only using the CPU. And re realistically, this is fairly well optimized, but actually um, there's a surprisingly big gap, um, which actually Intel has some engineers working on a fully roofline design of machine learning algorithms f uh, using their knowledge of the Intel architecture. And this gap's going to close a lot, although we're also, um, we're also going to make that go a lot faster. I'll talk about that pretty soon. Um, <clears throat> uh, anyway, we have a good advantage over VW and LibLinear is a system that's specialized for SVMs and logistic regression. And finally, scikit-learn. Um, is, uh, you know, it's a, it's like it learns sort of a good reference architecture for a lot of machine learning algorithms, um, but not necessarily high speed. All right, so, <clears throat> um, and those, just to remind you, obviously, when you're going faster, you're saving energy and money at the same time. Um, oops, sorry. So, <clears throat> um, and if we compare with cluster systems, um, you know, a few more diverse benchmarks now. Again, we can, um, we're pretty competitive with Spark. This is, the number of cores, uh, I think that was an eight node cluster. And um, uh, let's see, we're still a couple of orders of magnitude. So, you know, with Spark, because it's a distributed system, there's both the fact that the, um, the system itself is not really optimized for hardware, and also it's running across, um, I should have written up the network. Uh, it's um, it's the, the faster network, it's Amazon's uh, fast network, which is somewhere between one and 10 gigab gigabits. I think it's believed to be five gigabit networking or half a, a 10 gigabit network. So, so the disadvantage Spark has is it's running across that relatively slow, slow network. And also it's, it's, Spark also does batch processing for logistic regression. It doesn't have a, um, an online learner like most other systems do. Um, for random forest, we're, we're pretty close to Spark on that eight node cluster. And there, the algorithms are even more similar. It's a random forest, so really we're just gaining from the, uh, the CPU performance. Excuse me, we're gaining from the GPU performance. And finally, um, this is a big click prediction data set and uh, a larger Spark cluster, and we, we have an order of magnitude advantage there. Um, logistic regression, I don't know, that's a bit of a surprise. Uh, I can't completely explain that gap, that's just what we measured. Um, anyway. 
uh, and as we get into more compute intensive calculations, so these, these are actually not very expensive calculations. Logistic regression is sort of the minimum, almost the minimal amount of work um, to compute a, a, a model. Uh, random forests is, uh, is more expensive, but it's also very sequential, so we don't really gain much advantage there. On the other hand, things like um, k-means matrix factorizations, these are heavily uh, granularly parallel algorithms, so we can get a lot of gain there. And there on this, this is a 100 node cluster, um, we are a little faster than Spark, and this is the uh, GPU that's in Amazon EC2 instances basically, so you can rent those. Um, and you'll have that significant advantage, basically you get single machine performance comparable with the, the 100 node cluster. If you're able to buy some new hardware, you can buy the latest NVIDIA um, graphics processors and pack four Titan X's into a box. And then you're nearly an order of magnitude faster than that 100 node cluster. And of course, you're saving a ton of energy and money. Um, and similarly, GraphLab, if we compare with the public version of GraphLab doing matrix factorization, because um, that, that seems to be their specialty. Um, on the Netflix data set, we're doing, uh, again, quite a bit better uh, in terms of performance, in terms of time to get to similar accuracy. So, um, so you can see that there's huge benefits to using roofline design, um, especially given the progress in graphics processors um, compared to trying to parallelize on a network. Um, and I'll just very quickly go over this. This is what's going on here, by the way, is that we, we also work on algorithm design and we recently um, came up with some improvements in Gibbs sampling. Uh, so this, these numbers actually benefit from really having a better algorithm as well as having the fast hardware. Um, so Yahoo 1000 is a, a cluster that Yahoo's been developing for several years that specialized for this uh, latent Dirichlet allocation. So it does that one algorithm, uh, runs on a thousand, uh, for a thousand dimensional model, it takes about two days roughly, uh, costs $40,000 um, and consumes that many, some large number of mega, megajoules of energy. It's actually you know, gigajoules. Um, so on the Amazon instances, we can run that problem. It takes us a little longer, but uh, it's a $60 calculation on EC2 uh, versus a $40,000 calculation. And with the dev box, if you can afford one of those, um, you can shrink the time down to about uh, 15 hours or something and about the same cost. So recently there's a lot of interest in uh, parameter servers. Um, this is a Petroum server from, from CMU running on 32 nodes. Um, they did an implementation of the Gibbs sampler. If you do the math, they're, they're outperforming um, Yahoo by a factor of three or four, but still we have that big advantage um, because of the very high th memory throughput. And by the way, this is a smaller data set, so don't try to compare these last two lines with the other ones. But we still have a big advantage. Again, there's partly an algorithmic advantage um, over that system. And we're getting comparable accuracy in that calculation. So finally, you can run uh, our system at scale because it's just streaming data off disk um, and doing, it, doing the calculation fast. You can scale it up to multi-terabyte data sets. It is a couple of days, I think. It's the order of two days, I think. But still, it's going to converge and it'll give you a, a result. So the one caveat, all right, I think it's coming up. Oh, sorry, two more, I'm sorry, two more examples. So we, we are trying it in industry. I was at Microsoft last year and we did a couple of deployments. Um, one, you know, one thing to keep in mind is because of that graphic in the first, first slide showing rapid iteration, um, being able to rapidly iterate on a single machine inexpensively can easily create profit. <laughs> so uh, an undergrad spent was using an existing tool and it took about a week to build, a, to do a cycle of model building. Um, with the Bidmark, they were running about a one hour cycle of updates. And basically they did, you know, uh, the normal feature engineering, uh, t tweaking features, tweaking model parameters that you would do in a machine learning algorithm and got the accuracy up about 15%. So, um, so that's very typical. If you can iterate more, you can get higher performance, and often that means higher revenue. Um, an auction simulation, this is uh, it's too, I don't have time to go into this, but it's very interesting because between two generations of devices, 
uh, NVIDIA drastically increased uh, the registers that were available per thread. They actually didn't increase the total number of registers, but they made more of them available uh, in one thread. What that meant is basically we could have these single threaded simulations of one set of auction parameters. They would fit in those registers. You could simulate, you know, showing the ad, people bidding on it, um, ranking the bids and so on, all with register memory. And that gave this pretty dramatic speed up um, and you know this simulation was running much faster than a, a very big cluster. So <clears throat> yeah, so lots of interesting potential for new ways. It, it, it took some uh, pretty quirky programming to do that though, but lots of interesting things you can do because of this very fast single cycle memory. All right, and just very quickly, so it's, it's fast and then single machines and it's comparable on these light workload problems to uh, eight to 16 worker clusters. Those are not really, um, actually main memory bandwidth limited anyway. But for some of the other calculations that are, we start to see this, this ratio of around 100 to 1,000 nodes. And these are the algorithms that we currently implement. And we're fairly sure the ones in dark green are faster than any other implementation. And the ones in light green are comparable. Um, all right, so, and, uh, so one thing that's been happening lately is we're moving from a kind of a first generation architecture where we use matrix kernels that have been roof lined. So we optimize, you know, a dense matrix, sparse matrix multiplies usually the first stage. And then there's another one at the, at the tail end. But um, through this pipeline, we're, we're actually processing, you know, individual samples of data, individual data vectors. And so there's some inefficiency in kind of, um, moving them in and out of memory. So if you make a similar thing with image processing, if you have to process an entire image, put it into memory, take it out of memory, process it again, you're paying the memory uh, bandwidth costs multiple times. So um, yeah, we, so we're at right currently in around the 70 gigaflops range. That, that's a fairly consistent number across algorithms. Um, but the intermediate results uh, actually dominate the, the pipeline. So. What we're doing instead now is taking the whole pipeline and, and trying to build a single uh, GPU kernel to do that. And that's very much what Intel's doing also with their CPU kernels for uh, machine learning. So when they compare one of their pipeline kernels against our batch kernel, they get pretty close to the GPU speed. On the other hand, when we build pipelined um, GPU kernels, we increase the gap out roughly to a 10x again. So uh, anyway, so yeah, so that's what we're doing now is starting to build these end-to-end -end learners with graphics processors and it should give us a two or three X speed up from, from where we are now. Um, so one sort of pushback from that is that it, it is kind of breaking the, you know, the nice abstraction layers that we've built up in Bidmar. Currently uh, programming learners, the, the code is quite simple and easy to interpret. Uh, because we've actually hidden the complexity of the GPU kernels in these matrix operations. So um, yeah, we're gonna open that up and the, the code's gonna get a bit messier, but the idea is to follow um, a kind of a templated design where we, we build templated kernels where you can change um, the, the uh, transformation function S, you can change the dimension of the blocks and so on parametrically. And, we think we can cover a lot of standard machine learning kernels using just a very small number of handwritten and optimized templated kernels. So first example is word to vec which is um, a very popular uh, algorithm for text embedding. And it's a communication, communication intensive algorithm. It's basically bottlenecked by the uh, cost of doing inner products between embedding vectors for different words. Google has a, a reference implementation that they release that's pretty well written. Um, it's open source code, uh, multi-threaded, and um, it, it gets about 30 gigaflops on a typical, uh, let's say, Sandy Bridge machine, which is actually pretty good for that kind of machine on sparse data. So they, they clearly spend a bit of time optimizing that for CPUs. And it also gets pretty much close to the maximum ba uh, bandwidth for this is, act I've actually got two different numbers here, I'm sorry, this is for um, the Haswell processor. But um, anyway, they're pretty close to the limits in this kernel for CPUs. So on the other hand, if we're on a GPU, we should be able to um, uh, go much higher, but we'll have to use that register storage trick. So we, we did that and basically 
um, store those temporary results that I showed in the previous flowcharts uh, right in the register memories. We have a lot of registers so we can do that. And that gets us up to about a 3x improvement per GPU. And then with some careful um, data sharing across GPUs, we can get up to uh, around 600 gigaflops or 20 million words per second um, on a quad GPU system. And that's pretty fast. I don't know if people, it's not too many people seem to look at flops in, uh, in the uh, sort of distributed data area, but that's, that's a big number for a, a sparse calculation. Mo most of the algorithms in Spark or GraphLab per, per machine are typically well below a gigaflop. So this is a big number. Um, and we actually don't think you can match that with, without similar to code to what we're doing, which is hardware accelerated, uses native code and so on. Um, <clears throat> so uh, we're working on the, the next release, um, and that will include end-to-end -end GPU learners, and we expect about a, a 2 to 3x speed up. Um, and the big uh, caveat, which is leading into the last part of the talk, is that we're limited to um, about 12 gigabytes of, of memory on GPUs right now. So um, we're streaming data off of disk, but the, me the um, models have to be resident in GPU memory in order for us to get good throughput. So there's a lot of demand in industry, though, for larger models that won't fit in main memory. That way you can model, if you like, the tail uh, of the user distribution, the tail of the features. So we still want to try to optimize using similar methods for network communication. So that's the scaling out part. Um, there are two, way, two kinds of parallelism. Um, the easy kind, which I just alluded to, which we've been talking about so far, which is where the, if you do distribute, you just um, distribute the data. Different uh, machines process different subsets of data, but each machine has a complete copy of the model. Then all you have to do is, is, um, is communicate enough to keep the models in sync. And there's no real lower bound on how much communication there is, or there might be, but it's, it's pretty modest. Uh, model parallelism is a lot harder. That means that you spread the data across nodes, but then um, the model is also distributed. So when you get a block of data, you have to pull together all the pieces of, of model that you need. Um, and it's been shown that for typical sparse data, there's no efficient partitioning of the model that will work. So essentially, you have to randomly allocate the model across nodes and pull almost the full, uh, almost a full bandwidth um, communication step to pull all of the uh, model coefficients to the each compute node. So that's hard. Um, but it turns out you can implement both of those operations using a single primitive or reduce, which is what uh, people do in scientific computing. That's a, an MPI primitive name. Um, so in the data parallel -like case, so all reduce just means that you do a reduce, typically an averaging of models, and then you transmit it to all the nodes again. So in the data parallel case, that's exactly what you do. You take uh, multiple copies of the model, so say take an average and then distribute it again. Um, in the model parallel, parallel case, it's less obvious, but uh, you can implement all of our learners using a distributed matrix multiply, and the matrix multiply itself can be implemented with an all reduce. So, um, and we get into a bit of design philosophy here. So if you notice, we're not following the, the par parameter server paradigm, which has become popular recently. Um, and the parameter server also departed from the Hadoop model, which is which for kind of unclear reasons. Uh, so MapReduce started out as a synchronous protocol where the, the nodes are more or less synchronized by a protocol uh, with some asynchrony, but, but still uh, they're being coordinated. And the parameter server is an, uh, an uncoordinated model where clients push data uh, at random times. And we would argue that it's much more efficient to use a synchronous server pull model, given that the clients have no natural schedule anyway. They have no way to know when to push um, or start computing data except what the server tells them to do. So we simply turn things around and have the server run the operation. And that creates uh, uh, potentially higher performance through flying, no, no contention, and also makes the um, algorithm itself or the protocol a lot simpler because we don't have to worry about uh, locks and so on. So, um, and finally, we can actually do much more sophisticated error recovery um, and things like network aware design with less code complexity. So, uh, and a last reason for doing this work is that we noticed that 
uh, when you try to run fast learners at scale, you run into problems that uh, of scale, namely the all-to-all -all topologies that are used in uh, most distributed systems don't scale really as the as uh, you increase the number of uh, nodes, even if you had a full bandwidth network, the message sizes get smaller and smaller and eventually you hit a latency floor. Uh, this going through multiple layers of switches imposes a fairly high floor on the um, minimum ef uh, efficient packet size. So in Amazon we measured it around five megabytes. If you try to send packets much smaller than that, your throughput drops off because they become latency dominated. So, um, so this is not a good idea. Um, so what else can you do? Well, basically if we construct a roofline plot again for the network, what we, we have a fundamental network capacity and we also have a straight line portion which is uh, dictated again by latency, just like memory, the straight line of memory was dictated by, uh, well, throughput, but it's sort of ultimately latency driven. Um, and so you get the straight line here and you, you end up wanting to be here because the, uh, the smaller packet size you can tolerate, that means the higher the degree of the network and therefore the fewer layers of communication you need. So how do we do that? Oh yeah, the other complication is that we're dealing with power law data. So we have this long tail, but it's actually gonna turn out to be almost an advantage for this protocol. So we defined a, a nested reduce operation. So now if you have a whole, a whole lot of nodes, imagine putting them on a multi-dimensional grid like this. And now imagine we do the all reduce operations along one axis at a time. And it's always gonna be, the, the first axis is always gonna be longer than the others. And so we do this reduce here, we do a reduce there, and we do a reduce there. What happens each reduce is that the volume of data gets reduced as well because you're sort of doing an aggregate. Um, and so that reduction actually helps you deal with uh, a lot of things. Um, I'll show you in a sec. Actually, it's best, best if I just show you. Um, here's a quick sketch of the protocol and I'm running out of time so I won't go into that. Um, when we, you know, we implemented this algorithm on EC2 and we got some nice speed ups. This is a log scale, so we're outperforming PowerGraph and, and Hadoop, um, let's see, by roughly a, a three or six on those two benchmarks. Uh, that's for PageRank. And as far as we know, this is the fastest PageRank implementation. Um, and it's a layered protocol, and the nice property it has is the, because of the uh, sort of collisions, if you like, between um, the sparse data vectors as you go down and as you reduce layer by layer, you're actually reducing the total volume of data. And, and if you look at the layer by layer, the volume of data for the Twitter problem is, is like this. And that one is three layers. This is the dimensions of the grid, eight by four by two. It starts at eight. Uh, on the next layer, it drops it by more than two and so on. So the data volume is decreasing, which means the total volume of communication is only a bit more than the top layer. So it's, um, it, it, so effectively we're getting close to the theoretical limit because we can't push data faster than the, the interfaces of the individual servers can tolerate. But we get actually quite close, at least within a factor of two of the practical limit. Um, it's conjectured to be five gigabits for the machines we, we used on Amazon. So even nicer is that if we, if we do that deliberately, we know something about the network, we can arrange these reduces, let's say, within the racks of an oversubscribed network. So by the time the data is coming out of the top of the, uh, the rack, it's reduced by, in this case, about 5x. So we've actually pushed it under the oversubscription ratio, and therefore the network won't, uh, won't slow us down. So with, um, yeah, so we should potentially, <clears throat> Uh, in at least the newer generations of, of data center and perhaps some of the older ones too, um, be able to do um, full speed uh, all reduces and basically have the machine learning algorithms run as fast as the network interfaces can go. And we also have some tricks for reducing the bandwidth using the uh, power law statistics, which should give us another order of magnitude. So these would be pretty high gains over where uh, other state of the art systems are right now. All right, so to summarize, um, modern SIM, SIMD hardware, uh, GPUs have very high main memory bandwidth and you can exploit that directly for um, moderately sized models up to about 
uh, you know, 12 gigabytes on sparse data. Um, Roofline design has given us a systematic way to sort of try to optimize and tell us if we're near the optimum for those computational kernels. And um, it gives us typically big advantages over systems which are not roofline. So commodity networks have, by comparison, quite low bisection bandwidth, and um, even with thousands of nodes. So it's worth really thinking about how to mitigate that. And I presented one method in the talk, and there's another one that we're working on. Uh, and f uh, uh, yes, end-to-end -end design, this is our next generation. We should be able to get another factor of three or so by basically using the register memory and the GPUs. And we've conjectured those kernels will be very hard to match on, on stand with um, unaccelerated code on clusters of any scale. Um, on the other hand, though, sometimes you do have to scale to use bigger models, and you can apply roofline design for network primitives to do that. And because of the uh, reduction that happens in those nested protocols, even though they're a little bit inefficient because of having multiple layers, you can still get close to optimal throughput because of the collapsing of volume in each layer. All right, so, there's, so the software is available. It's a BSD open source, and the dependencies are open source. Uh, it's on GitHub. And the things that should be out soon, most of these are finished. We're working hard on Spark integration, though, too, because we like it to be sort of easily accessible from uh, ex other tools, um, so don't have to run it standalone. And in particular, we want this fast all reduce to be available, because it, it should produce pretty big gains in um, most distributed algorithms, uh, perhaps more with ours, because ours are already roofline, and so they won't bottleneck in the, in the CPU code. Uh, and there's some other cool stuff. So um, by all means, try it out and give us feedback on uh, what we should be doing. All right, thank you.